Alright guys, so we are on the ghost something tour and we are allowed to film! So let's see. Um, so, <coughs> I just want to start tonight's tour with a question. This is not a trick question, it's quite an easy question. But this is a question that not everybody has got right before, so here we go. Over there is one of London's most famous landmarks. Can anyone tell me what it's called? Tower of London. Yeah, it's <laughs> that sorry, easy. Sorry. No, seriously, it's that easy. Well done, the Tower of London. If any of you were even struggling with that, look over there. They've even written. Oh, yeah, okay. Now, believe it or not, I was doing this about a year ago. Uh, and there was a guy on the tour who said he was born in London, lived in London. I asked that question and he said, the Houses of Parliament. And everybody laughed. We all assumed this guy was joking. It turns out he was not joking. So well done to you guys for passing the test of not being an idiot. <laughs> Slightly harder question. Uh, does anyone know how old this place is when they originally started building it? Anyone want to guess? Go on. No, um, Team Switzerland, not, not going to commit. Very neutral, perhaps, yeah. Uh, anyone? Anyone want to get that? Uh, I'll, give, no, it, I'll no. give the answer. Oh, go on, when? That's pretty good, but it's a bit older than that. They originally started work on this back in the 1070s. So it's a castle in the middle of London that is very nearly 1,000 years old. Wow. And can anyone here tell me what it's most famously been used for throughout its history? Has anyone here ever heard of John Quincy Adams? He was the USA's sixth president. He got married inside that church. Uh, a name that would be close to home for me. I don't know if any of you would have a reason to have heard of this person, but I'll check anyway. Have any of you ever heard of a man called Samuel Pepys? The road next door to this one, called Pudding Lane, there was a bakery. And the bakery that night was being run by a guy called Thomas Farron. Thomas Farron realised that there was a fire in his bakery uh, and he realised this was a problem. He went running off down the road to find someone called the Lord Mayor of London. He got him out of bed, dragged him down to Pudding Lane, showed him the fire in the bakery and the Lord Mayor of London did not care. He didn't think this was a particularly big deal. He would say this to Thomas Farriner. He said, don't worry because a woman could piss out the flames. It turns out a woman could not do that. The fire would continue. Yeah, that's all of this. Are you good at teaching? Because if you live in London, you don't be in London. Yeah, I'm sure. I think it's the point. I've never gone to Skyward. Oh, we're just going, okay, under. I think there's a little bit of a story here. Fordi vi har ikke gået nok stærs de her dage. Anyway, this I like think this is quite an impressive part of London. Have any of you guys been here before? Do any of you guys know what the buildings are that surround us? Like that one over there. Anyone know? You've definitely heard of this. Is your English? That is the Bank of England. That is the world's oldest central bank. Uh, it has been in constant operation since 1694. It's where we have gold supply. It's where we set the interest rates. What about this one over here? If you're clever, you may be able to read its name on the front door. It's called the Royal Exchange. Uh, does anyone know anything about the history of the Royal Exchange? So the Royal Exchange originally opened in 1566. That is not the original building. That one replaced it in the 1800s. But what is the big thing going on in the world in the mid 1500s? It's about the same time that European explorers are starting to travel the world for the first time. They're going to exciting new places like China and India and the Americas and they're bringing home exotic new goods. Stuff like tea and potatoes. I don't know if you're aware of this, when the potato first arrived in London it blew people's mind. There was genuinely a period of time where people couldn't work out whether they wanted to eat potatoes or smoke potatoes. What everybody could agree on was they wanted to buy potatoes they built this place to showcase those new goods and that's all it does today. It's a shopping mall. If you come here during the day, it's just it's an extremely busy place. 
and it has been an extremely busy financial district for a very long time. I have a ghost story connected to this place being a financial district. Now for this, we go back to the early 1800s. In the early 1800s, a young man works around this area of London called John Stott. Magnificently wealthy, he's married to a lady called Alice. Alice lives his life of wealth, of privilege, of comfort. Unfortunately for Alice, John, her husband, dies young. And Alice is really sad, and she's lost her husband. But one thought is gonna help Alice get through the grieving process, and it's this. She gets to inherit John's money and carry on living that nice lifestyle. Unfortunately for Alice, she goes to hear John's will being read, and very quickly she realizes John had loads of mistresses and loads of illegitimate children and loads of the money goes to them. Not that much goes to Alice. And Alice is like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? She's clever. She knows all of her husband's old friends, also very wealthy men. And she knows that they like hanging around shopping by the Royal Exchange. So she thinks, I'll hang around, I'll shop by the Royal Exchange. When she sees them, her plan is say, hey guys, John didn't leave me anything help me in. To start with, it doesn't work. People just keep saying, no, Alice, not our responsibility, go away. She's determined. She keeps coming back. They're known as the Bow Bells. Now, once upon a time, when the Bow Bells would ring, you could hear them over about a five mile radius, or about an eight kilometre radius, so loads of people could have considered themselves Cockneys, true East Londoners. The difference is now, London is a very different city. The buildings are all taller, there's loads more. Why is this, <laughs> this is my alley. <laughs> so, look at that, guys. This is what is left uh, of Christchurch Greyfriars. Does anyone know, or would anyone like to guess why it's in this condition? Your, it's always either burning or World War II. World War II is the answer. Uh, it was bombed in 1940. It was built just after the Great Fire of London. Uh, it stood all the way up until 1940, when unfortunately one night it was destroyed during a, during a bombing raid. In 1948, they had a discussion, what do we do with what is left of this place? So they said, leave it here. It's like a monument to the horrors of war. So they did leave it here. And eventually they put this lovely garden in the middle of it. And all the buildings that surround us, they're just office blocks. Come here Monday to Friday at lunchtime. It is full of people sitting around, having a cup of tea, a sandwich, and enjoying their lunch break. It looks beautiful. But as beautiful as it is, there is a horrible ghost story connected to it. For this, we go back to the days just after the Great Fire of London. Now, do you remember earlier in the tour, I said the Great Fire of London was responsible for burning down roughly 80% of what was considered London at the time. That meant thousands of Londoners found themselves homeless. So with nowhere to go, these Londoners, they just kind of live in makeshift campsites in various areas around the city. This general area became one of those campsites. People who were living here in the, 60, in the 1660s, the late 1660s, they started to report sightings of people who would appear, look at the sky, and they said after a few moments, the skin on the face and the hands and the arms of these people would start to blister and boil and bubble and then just slowly drip from them down to the floor. And these people would melt into the floor like the Wicked Witch of the West from the Wizard of Oz. People at the time said, these are ghosts of people who perished in the flames of the fire of London and they're now just caught here reliving their death over and over again. Does anyone know how many people died as a result of the Great Fire of London? Would anyone like to guess? If I give you the figures, the population of London was roughly half a million, uh, and 80% of the buildings are destroyed. Anyone want to make a guess on how many died? No? The official figure is six. Not like 6,000 or 600, six people less people than we have on tonight's door. And most historians have gone, that can't be right. You can't have a city that big almost be entirely destroyed and have only six people die. They say it doesn't make any sense. So historians have said, look at this a different way. Back in the 1600s, you have a government that doesn't really care about all the people. Nor is it very good at keeping a census. Maybe loads of people died who simply were not a kid. Then you'll have like something ultra modern. 
Yeah. So if you go underneath where the walkie talkie is, where we were earlier, there is a little Victorian market. Four weddings and a funeral with Hugh Grant. But yeah, this is the fourth wedding church where the Hugh Grant wedding is meant to take place in that movie. What about Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves with Kevin Costner, Alan Rickman, Morgan Freeman? This is Nottingham Cathedral in that movie. It's where Alan Rickman, the sheriff of Nottingham, tells Robin he's going to cut his heart out with a rusty spoon. Mm -hmm. I have a ghost story connected with this place. Now for this we go back to the 1100s when the church originally opened. Back in those days there was a man connected with it called Rahir. Rahir was like a local dude. For reasons we don't quite understand today, somebody stole one of the shoes Rahir was meant to be buried in, and they didn't give it back. So Rahir would end up being buried wearing just one shoe. Now believe it or not, over the centuries people have claimed that while being in this churchyard, they have been approached by a Oh, no stress, no stress. Oh, I'm so blue because then I can... Uh... Look at that, guys. So, guys, I'm just filming a little bit. I'm not filming everything because obviously you have to come here and try it yourself. I, I, I was doing this the other night and there was some um, Scottish ladies and they were like touching it, like singing flower of Scotland under the breath and going down for it. But yeah, if you come here in England and we play uh, Scotland in the football or the rugby, the day after this thing is like a flower. It's incredible. So if that's happening and you're in London, come down and have a look. It's quite amazing. Uh, when have you done looking at that? I just like to point out, can you see like as you look across this building, there are like chunks missing out of the brick? That shrapnel damage caused by bombing during the Second World War. So this area oh. was almost entirely flat during World War II. The market over there uh, is completely rebuilt after World War II. Just left in the ruin. Uh, but this wall was left standing, and they never bothered to repair the damage to the wall. So, uh, and whenever you're ready, I'll walk you around the corner and tell you one of London's most bizarre ghost stories. It's known as Scratching Fanny of the Cock Lane. So whenever you're ready, follow me. In the 1760s, there is a man living on this road, uh, Cock Lane, called William Kent. He lives here with his wife, Fanny. Unfortunately for William, Fanny dies young, and he doesn't deal with this very well. He's very sad to him. So what I'll do, I'll find someone to move in with me, keep me company, take my mind off of my dead wife. So he does. He finds a man called Richard Parsons to move in with him. Richard Parsons moves in, but he also has an eight-year-old daughter, Elizabeth. So for a few months, William, Richard and Elizabeth all live happily in William's house here on Cockway. Until eventually William realises that Richard hasn't paid him any rent money yet. And that's important because he wants to get paid. So William calls a meeting with Richard and Richard turns up to the meeting but he does something odd. He brings his daughter Elizabeth along with him which is weird because what eight year old wants to hang around listening to their dad discuss financial matters. She's poor. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the meeting, Elizabeth just pipes up and says, Daddy, 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 I can hear scratching in the walls. Richard's busy. He says, don't worry about that. It's probably rats or mice. William lost his temper. He said, how dare you? I run a clean house. We haven't got any rats or mice in this house. Richard sarcastically replies, if it's not rats or mice, then it must be a ghost. And his daughter Elizabeth says, yes, Daddy, I think it could be a ghost. So for fun with his daughter, just humouring her, he says, let's find out. Let's ask it a question. Are you a ghost? One knock for yes, two knocks for no. There is a knock on. <coughs> Richard, William and Elizabeth all stand there and look at each other. They ask it another question. Another knock, another question, another question, another knock. The three of them would stand there asking that scratching and knocking noise questions until eventually it told them it was the ghost of William's dead wife, 
fanny pack. Now, I'm not joking. News of this gets out around London and a kind of hysteria breaks. People would start queuing the length of Cock Lane to come to William's front door, knock on it, and demand to speak to the ghost of his dead wife. They want to ask her questions like, what does it feel like to die? Is there an afterlife? If there is, is Elvis there, right? Whatever questions are going through people's minds. This got so big, the government realised it was going on, and they took it somewhat seriously. Seriously enough that they would actually debate this in Parliament. They did debate it in Parliament, and they came to the conclusion, why not? A ghost could be living on Cockney, but the way they saw it is a ghost would only be haunting us if it was here to warn us about something. So now the government are in origin as a, a French invasion on the way, and they have to put an army together to fight that. So they assembled a team of experts to come here and interview the ghost of Fanny Ken. One of the people on their team of experts was a man called Dr. Samuel Johnson. Has anyone ever heard of him? If you haven't, he would be the man who goes down in history for inventing the dictionary. Not just one of the smartest people in London at the time, quite possibly one of the smartest people in the world at the time, he sent along with a team of other smart people to talk to a scratching and knocking noise in a house on this street. And they get here, they interview it, and it tells them it's Fanny Kent. But now she goes further. She tells them that she was sent here because she was murdered by her husband, William. This is no longer now an investigation into the paranormal. This is an investigation into murder. So William is kind of basically arrested so he can't make a getaway. Now a court case starts. I would like to add, this is the only court case in British history where a ghost was called as a witness. While all of this madness is going on, a new team of experts is sent down to Cock Lane. The new team of experts interview the scratching and knocking noise, but they realise something very odd is happening. They work out that scratching and knocking can only ever be heard if the little girl Elizabeth is also in the house. They assume that she must be in this. And they start searching through her belongings, and she does own a little wooden door she could have been making noises with. Also, they realise that while all of this has been going on, no one's been paying any attention to her. So perhaps she's been running off to other parts of the house and knocking on the walls or unlocking doors to let friends of hers in to do the same thing. Why would she want to frame William, though, for the murder of his dead wife? They questioned her, and under the pressure of questioning, she cracked almost immediately. She told them that her father, Richard, owed William such a huge amount of money he knew he couldn't pay it back. So he had come up with a scheme to frame Richard, I'm oh, sorry, to frame William for the death of his wife. That has to be the most insane and elaborate scheme in the history of insane and elaborate schemes. And the even more ridiculous thing is he nearly got a vote in. It created hysteria around London. The government were looking into this. Prominent historical figures were poking their guns in to see what was happening. Richard was found guilty of fraud. He ended up being sent to prison for roughly two years and his daughter Elizabeth taken away from him. This is an incredible building because of its size, because of its design, but also because it's just about the only old building that we've walked past tonight that I haven't had to say was destroyed and then rebuilt during the Second World War. And, and part of the reason for that is because of our Prime Minister during the Second World War, Winston Churchill. He had an idea. He said, look, London gets bombed every single night. Londoners are waking up. They see nothing but destruction in front of them. Wouldn't it be great if we could keep St Paul's Cathedral standing? Because then when Londoners look out across that destruction, they'll see the dome of St Paul's, and it doesn't just tell them that the cathedral's still there. It kind of becomes a symbol that Britain's still there, and it continues fighting the war. In order to keep St Paul's Cathedral standing during the Second World War, very brave people had to put themselves into very dangerous situations. In the middle of bombing raids, there were teams of people standing around the outside of this building looking to repair damage and put out fire as quickly as they possibly could. Even the Dean of St Paul's would spend most nights of the war on the roof of St Paul's with buckets of sand doing exactly that. In November of 1940, a man called Brian Summers was standing roughly where we are today with a group of his friends. They're in the middle of a bombing raid and they see an incendiary bomb strike the central mountain. So Brian and his friends erect a ladder 
and Brian goes climbing to the top of the ladder with a bucket of sand. He's ready to put those flames out. When he gets to the top of the ladder, he realizes that he's further away from the flames than he thought he was. He can't quite reach them. So now he has a decision to make. He can climb back down the ladder, reset it, and climb back up again. If he does that, he can reach the flames. But also time passes, so maybe the flames spread. It's too late to deal with them. Or he can get off at the top of the ladder and start wandering around on the balcony. It's unsafe, it's unstable, it's a bombing raid, he could fall off and die. He said he didn't know what to do next. But he said while he was making up his mind, he saw something incredible. He said through the smoke, there appeared the figure of a man next to the flames. And he said that man bent down, hit the flames up in his arms, and moved them a step closer to Brian and placed them on the floor. Brian could reach them, Brian could put them out, he climbs back down the ladder, he sees his friends and he's like, oh my god, you'll never guess what I've just seen. And all of his friends say, Brian, you didn't see that, you've lost your mind, that's crazy. It's very late, you're probably very tired, there's loads of smoke up there, Brian, maybe you've inhaled too much or something, you're hallucinating. They told him to go home, get some rest, go to bed. He did go home, he did get some rest, he did go to bed. What he didn't do was change his story. Now, he would go to his deathbed in the 1960s, swearing that what he saw that night was true. He claimed he had seen a ghost, a spirit, possibly even an angel. And he said maybe it was there that night during the war, helping to keep the building safe. And he went further than that. He said maybe that ghost, that spirit, that angel is always at St Paul's. And he said for that reason alone, he believed that this building would continue to stand for the rest of the time. Guys, that is the end of the ghost talk. If you now have any questions, any questions like where the hell are we? How do we get to the nearest tube station? Or do you know any good pubs in the area? Please feel free to join tonight's talk. It would be really kind if you went on TripAdvisor or wherever you looked through and left a nice review. If you didn't like tonight's talk, then let's just pretend that this never happened. But otherwise, <laughs> any questions, guys? <laughs> Need directions to a pub, maybe? Sure. <laughs> no pub. 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 Uh, a lot of them are closed around here. If you go down there, there's a pub called Ye Old London. It dates from the 1700s. That should be open. Ooh. That's pretty good. That way? Yeah, I, I can walk. I'm going that way myself, so I'll walk you up past Ye Old London. If you want. Um, yeah, so that should be open. Anyone else? Tube or? I mean, like Google Maps exists, so. So, what do you think about the tour? I think it was a lot of interesting stories. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a lot. The only thing I wish was that it had been more like we could get in places, you know? Yeah, yeah, and it yeah. It could be like right, like when they were told about, um, you know, the church. Yeah. You could be like we're right at this bench. Yeah. You know? yeah. Or when it was when we were at the tower or the the monument. Yeah. And we went all the way down there and it was like from right up here. Yeah. You know. I would I would have loved that too. Because yeah. it was it, it was good but it felt a little bit like a a job for him. Also a little rushed. Yeah. I felt like if he had taken some time to build some more atmosphere. I mean, he was a great storyteller, yeah, yeah, yeah. don't get me wrong, he just felt like he had something to do right about Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I was allowed to film it, so that's also... Yeah, know. which was a plus, he was very friendly yeah. and open about that and taking pictures and stuff. Exactly, so that's good. So we like that. But it's like, it's like not that we didn't like it, it's just, you know, more like... Constructive criticism, you know. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, and you said.